Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to Derm Docs, powered by LiveDerm. Developed in collaboration with UCB, this special episode features esteemed dermatologists Dr. Jennifer Shao and Dr. Hadar Levtov as they discuss targeted intervention for hydrogenitis separativa, defining window of opportunity for moderate to severe patients. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Jenny Shao. I'm a dermatologist at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, and I see and treat a lot of patients with HS. I'm on the board of directors of the HS Foundation, an amazing organization that is working tirelessly to move the field of HS forward for our patients through education, research, and advocacy. And I'm so excited to be doing this podcast today with my wonderful colleague, Dr. Hadar Levtov, who is the president of the HS Foundation. Hello, Hadar. Hi, Jenny. Yes, uh, Hadar Levtov here from the University of Miami. I'm an associate professor of dermatology and also part of the gang at the HS Foundation who's really trying to make life better for people with HS. And today we want to talk about the disease and some of the challenges and hopefully provide some useful information to our listeners. What do you say, Jenny? Should we dive into it? Yeah, sounds great. I mean, I think one of the things that we really see as clinicians treating patients with HS is seeing that patient with moderate to severe disease coming through our door. And when we think about these patients, like, what do you feel like are key challenges that you face um, when having a patient with moderate to severe HS kind of sitting across from you in that patient room? Yeah, you're right, uh, Jenny. This is not an uncommon story. And definitely, I got to say, one of the first thoughts that come into my mind is, ah, if I could have just met you a few years earlier, right, and uh, try to help you, we really think that we can make a big difference earlier in the disease. And I think that brings in the issue of a delay to diagnosis that has been so well cited in the literature, anywhere from seven to 10 years on average, right? And so we wouldn't accept that for any other disease yet in HS. It's almost uh, every other patient comes in with years and years of going by without really getting a name for the disease they are dealing with. So I think that's a really big challenge when I look at these patients and I say to myself, all right, man, we're a little late into the game here. We can still make a big difference, but definitely that delayed diagnosis uh, is really a big challenge. And we are trying to make a difference in that, both on the foundation level and uh, as just uh, the team of healthcare or the house of medicine, if you will, to really try to drill into emergency room doctors, to primary care doctors, pediatricians, gynecologists, everybody, just to know that there are treatments out there and to recognize it early uh, because it's as easy as the, the three T's. So for those of you who are listening to us and don't know, this is my way of remembering how to diagnose a chest. It's very easy. It's a typical lesion. So an abscess, a nodule, a tunnel, right? Uh, Typical location, skin folds like armpits under the breasts, groin area, and a typical story. Hey, it keeps happening. It's a chronic process. If you have the three T's, you have a chest. There's no special test. There's no nothing. And so any clinician listening to this podcast right now can diagnose HS tomorrow. It's that easy and hopefully help us to close that uh, diagnostic gap that we have. And then we can offer our great treatments to um, to other because, and maybe Jenny, you can uh, confirm this, but I think it's a very common story. It leads to a lot of problems as delayed diagnosis, like switching treatments, going from a uh, different doctor to different doctor and never getting the diagnosis actually uh, really is a waste of time where we can make a real difference, right? Absolutely. And I think this really also speaks to the patient mindset by the time they finally get to see us. There's been a lot of broken trust through getting all those, you know, misdiagnoses over the years and perhaps being told that, you know, they have the condition because they shaved incorrectly or because they're overweight. And that's why they have, you know, these nodules or abscesses that keep occurring. Maybe they're not cleaning themselves well enough. So by the time that they come to see us, I think it's important for us to recognize that there is mistrust and, um, you know, and that this is our opportunity to turn this journey around for them and let them know that they've come to the right place, that we know what it is that they're dealing with and that we are going to make a difference and help their, you know, condition get better. And I think that setting that tone, listening to their story, validating the things that they went through and letting them know that from here on out, things will be different and we'll be working with them as care partners to try to help them get better is a huge deal. Yeah. And let's talk about what we can actually do for these folks, right? Because now there's a new era with some targeted therapies for HS. Um, 
even though we still don't really know what's causing it, you know, we're starting to get some clues and the literature is just uh, exploding. Every day I find new articles, but we still don't know what's causing this disease, yet we do have great therapies and often combination therapies. So when people come to us with moderate to severe HS, we can still make a big, big difference combining medical therapy uh, and surgical therapy. So maybe, uh, Jenny, you can give us kind of your gestalt of the overall management of moderate to severe HS, what can we do for these people? Yeah, so absolutely, I would say a cornerstone of therapy for patients who come in and they're beyond mild, right? You see them, you're like, you're definitely moderate to severe disease. Um, a biologic medication or some other immunomodulator type medication that you can use long term should be the cornerstone of therapy at this point, just given long term ability to use it and also the efficacy data that we're seeing. So um, I sort of think of, okay, I need something that's anti inflammatory to bring down the, you know, HS is such an incredibly has such a, an incredibly high burden of inflammation. I think of it as like a cutaneous condition with systemic inflammation that we need to like get back in check. And so for me, having that targeted therapy to help bring down inflammation is key. And then I think about the adjunct therapies that I can use around it. And that can be hormonal and metabolic therapies that we might use in milder patients, for example, but certainly in this day and age, multimodal therapy is key. And so I think about what about spironolactone or OCP or finasteride? Um, I think about other things like would an oral antibiotic still be helpful here to help try to get the disease under control faster, um, decrease some of that drainage and pain while we're waiting for some of the longer term therapies to kick in? Um, other things to think about. Um, so topical therapies, you know, you can still use like antiseptic washes, et cetera. But I think going back to like, the key thing that you'd want to use to try to get control longer term for somebody who has moderate to severe HS, it really centers back on a long-term therapy uh, targeted um, immunomodulating agent that I think will sort of be that cornerstone of what you put your other treatments around, including procedures. Yeah, absolutely. I really like that overview. I think it's really good. Uh, and I think you touched on something important that, uh, disease severity, because there's something there about mild, moderate, and severe disease. I think everybody kind of have a sense of, okay, this is mild and how I'll treat it. This is severe. This is how I'm going to treat it pretty much through everything. It's those moderate patients that sometimes are a challenge, right? They It brings to mind these two concepts that I want to talk about, if you don't mind for a minute, is what is moderate patient, right? Where do you classify them in your treatment algorithm or how you think about this? And couple that with that concept of window of opportunity that's been uh, propagated in the literature. And I think uh, we see that both in the numbers, but also in clinic every time, because as I mentioned in the opening for this podcast, that oh, I really wish I would have seen you uh, a little earlier, because there is that window before you start forming that very first tunnel, or maybe just before that first tunnel epithelialized on the inside, right? We have that opportunity to really make a difference and actually prevent the tissue destruction that we know HS can do. Uh, yet it's really hard to put a real number on it or a real diagnostic tool on it. We look at the skin and we say, okay, I don't see tunnels, but if I don't see tunnels, is that patient mild? Or if I see one tunnel, is that patient moderate, severe? Um, you know, it's sometimes hard to wrap your head around this. Uh, how do you think about these patients that kind of fall a little bit between uh, between the chairs, if you will, uh, when they come in probably with what we would call early stage two, but, you know, maybe there's more than one side. You, you get what I'm saying. How do you approach these patients? Yeah, it's a really... Um I think it's a really important question for us to answer because really I think about these patients maybe as our early moderate patients and we don't want to wait for them to get to late moderate where they're headed towards severe before we intervene. So what makes a patient an early moderate patient where you might be like, this is really a good time to talk about one of these like, you know, agents like a biologic to try to get in with therapy during that window of opportunity where they might be more responsive to treatment and also perhaps even have a chance at modulating disease progression to that late, moderate, or severe disease. Um, and so for me, one thing that's helpful is 
We do have the HS Physician Global Assessment Score, where basically patients are classified as moderate on this validated score if they just have five or more inflammatory nodules, or if they have one abscess or one inflammatory nodule or more. So for me, that implies you don't need a scar you don't need a sinus tract or tunnel in order to be classified as a moderate disease patient, right? And um, patients, for example, who other factors I take into consideration, if they've failed your first line therapies, like you've done your topical antiseptic wash, you've given them spironolactone, they've done three months of doxycycline, they're still getting recalcitrant inflammatory nodules and abscesses that are impacting their quality of life, right? That to me is a moderate patient. They have severe or frequent HS flares. Um, and then I do think that quality of life um, component is also really something that we as dermatologists need to listen to because a patient who is not able to function, not able to have a relationship, not able to go to school and go to PE or not able to go to work and function, this condition is definitely impacting their quality of life. So regardless of how many nodules they have or you know the fact that they don't have a scar tunnel, for me, that's a patient where they need our more, more advanced therapies. What about you, Hadar? Yeah, I pretty much agree with everything you said, Jenny. You painted it beautifully. I really like the concept of a journey, right? Of starting the patient saying, look, we tried A, B, and C. It's not really working for you. And so maybe it's time to, you know, step it up with our therapy, even for those patients who may on the surface seem like, well, you know, it's just nodular disease. There's not a lot there. But hey, if you gave them uh, the appropriate antimicrobial therapy, for example, uh, topical, systemic, uh, tried hormonal therapies as well, maybe it's time for uh, pulling the trigger on that more uh, sophisticated targeted therapies. I think that uh, one of the concepts that I borrow from a paper that is titled roughly, and forgive me, uh, the authors out there, uh, modified Hurley staging is the concept of tissue destruction and scarring versus inflammation. So uh, I think it touches to that moderate patient. It's another way to think about it. When you look at the patient, you can think along two axes. One is looking at the amount of inflammation, the erythema, how much pus is coming out, right? How many abscesses we have as opposed to just nodules um, and the tissue destruction, right? Uh, how many scars we have, how many tunnels, how many areas are involved, kind of putting all that together. Uh, and to me, I can have a patient that only has nodules, but if they have 20 nodules at any given moment, I don't even have to think twice. This patient is suffering. There's no question about it. And so to me, this is how I like to think about those two axes. And then, as you mentioned, go through that journey uh, with the patient and say, you know, maybe we will pull the trigger today in one of our targeted therapy. Maybe not. Maybe we'll do it in three months. But I want you to know that this is where we might be going. And hey, if we surprise each other and you come in and you're doing great, then that's fine. But if not, we move to the next one quickly because we don't want to miss that window of opportunity. Absolutely. And um, Hadar, when you like, you know, you and the patient kind of decide like, or you're starting that conversation with the patient about what it looks like or what it means to be on a targeted therapy. How do you kind of start that conversation? Um, and what are your steps to take to like, actually ensure we start from like conversation to the patient actually getting the medication? Oh, wow. Yeah, there's there's a lot to discuss there. Um, I, I do usually try to introduce this earlier in the process. So when uh, even in the first visit, uh, if it's appropriate, uh, I think it gives patients hope. Uh, as I mentioned, it's part of a journey. So by the time I come to it, they've already heard the concept before they had some time to maybe think about it. Uh, and then, you know, I tell them that we have a lot of experience with these drugs, right? Uh, we've, uh, HS is not the first or second or third disease to be treated with that. We have well over a decade, if not two decades now of experience with these uh, therapies, and we know how to do it. We know how to do it well. I do say that it's relatively new to HS, but still, even with HS, the first uh, uh, biologic was approved in 2016, I believe. And so we have uh, nearly a decade of experience with these kind of drugs. And so we know how to do it well. There's a few safety issues we have to keep in mind. I think people fall very quickly into the safety discussion before describing the benefits. And so this is, uh, you know, I tell them if these drugs had more than 10% of side effects on each and every aspect, they would never be approved. And so let's keep the side effect discussion for a minute aside and talk about the benefit. And those are, as you mentioned, anti-inflammatory. So I tell them you should expect less pain, less drainage, 
uh, maybe less uh, lesions, uh, and maybe some of the lesions will resolve as well. And, uh, you know, depending on the severity, we'll talk about do we need to combine this with other procedures as well, or other uh, um, drugs, let's say antibiotics, for example. And so, all of that comes into play. And then uh, we talk about the safety, you know, we do need to uh, get some blood tests uh, uh, to, you know, make sure that we're doing this in a safe way. And also we talk about what to expect, right? So these drugs have usually been studied in 12, usually 16 weeks. And so I tell them before three to four months, you know, we're not really going to judge how you're doing. Um, so that's kind of how I start the story. How about you, Jenny? Yeah, I think that all those points are things that we just run into clinic every day, even just starting a biologic um, on any patient with, you know, any any skin condition, even if it's not HS. Um, I do feel like with the HS patient population, um, you know, especially given the comorbidities that these patients may also be coming in with, um, there definitely can be patient sort of fear about starting a medication like a biologic. And I think addressing those concerns head on is really important. Like uncovering like what's what are the real concerns that this patient sitting in front of me has um, and discussing them out in the open and understanding it um, rather than just talking about the medication um, and not giving the patient a chance to tell you their concerns, because then no matter what you say, if you haven't addressed their particular true concern, it's unlikely right. that they're going to change their mind, right? And I feel like, like you said about the side effect discussion, I think there's very real risks of untreated HS. And, you know, I think that, you know, what are the side effects of untreated HS, right? We have unchecked systemic inflammation that likely has you know, implications for someone's cardiovascular health. We already know that sitting across from me right now, you are suffering, right, with untreated HS. And so I think letting them know that um, the other thing that I found to be helpful too is um, one thing that they, you know, often are worried about is, well, what if I try this um, and then it doesn't work? There's nothing else left yeah. for me. You know, nothing yeah. else is left. And I think, you know, you mentioned this earlier, there is a lot of hope. We do have other treatment options if the first biologic doesn't work. So letting them know there are other options. We we don't want to just reach for this as like a latch, a last ditch resort when you're like basically have very, very severe HS where honestly, it's less likely that you'll respond as well to the medication as you would right now, because there are other medications that we can use if this first one doesn't go as well as we'd like. So I think that's also helpful. Um, thinking about a patient's comorbidities when choosing a biologic, like does the patient, for example, also have psoriasis and you can choose a medication that you can tell them this will help your psoriasis and your HS, for example. Um, and then you mentioned getting labs done. I feel like for me, it's really helpful to try to get the labs done sooner rather than later after that yes. conversation. So like if your clinic has the capacity to do so, maybe they can get their labs done at the end of the clinic visit, or please stop by the lab before you go home. Um, I have my patient fill out patient assistant program paperwork in advance um, in case we're just, you know, preparing for potential denials, et cetera. And then importantly, I think documenting your clinic note um, appropriately to then reduce a back and forth later with insurance. So yes. I have a dot phrase that says something along the lines of this patient has moderate to severe HS. They have failed greater than 90 days of oral antibiotics. On exam, they have more than three to five abscesses or inflammatory nodules on exam. They are an appropriate candidate for a biologic agent. Um, just really laying it out there to reduce work for you and your staff on the back end. Um, and if the medication does get denied, being ready to, you know, for example, turn in a written appeal. And our HS Foundation website has these really helpful prior auth templates where you can basically go to the clinician resources site, go to the prior auth template website and download a template where there's like 20 to 30 references trying to support what you're trying to do for your patient. And you just plug and chug some of your patient's clinical info inside and you can just send that along. So I think that's really helpful too. Oh, yeah, I love that. And just to uh, be clear, this is the HS Foundation website. If you go to resources tab there, you can find ward templates, uh, one click, it's just all you need just click on the name of the drug. And poof, just like magic, a ward document opens, and then your staff can edit it to their need. And uh, voila, you have a prior authorization letter uh, made in seconds. So I think that's a, that's a great tip. By the way, uh, you, what you said was really important, the side effects of untreated HS. And 
I came up with this kind of concept of uh, and relating this to informed consent, because uh, one of the things we're trying to do when we talk about a new drug is essentially provide the patient with an informed consent. But I argue that people who lived with HS and other chronic disease, by the way, uh, for the last, uh, on average, seven to 10 years, uh, that really effectively is destroying their lives, they don't even remember or have an idea what it is to live without the suffering of HS. And so a lot of times I tell them, look, you can always stop a drug when they come in and they're concerned. And you really said it beautifully, Jenny, uh, you really have to uh, have the patient open up and tell you what are those barriers because it's very specific per patient. But inevitably, you know, it ends up being, look, you got to take a chance on this uh, and take a chance on yourself because you don't know. If you always, always, whenever you sat for an exam, there was always that concern of an abscess that's going to burst, okay? You never come ready for an exam. And so once you start taking one of these therapies that has the chance to really keep everything under control, all of a sudden you'll come to that exam and you are more prepared. Uh, and that example can be in sleep. You don't sleep. All of a sudden you are sleeping. Uh, you know, you never had uh, a significant other. All of a sudden you have a significant other. And now you understand what it means to live without the suffering of HS or let's just say with reduced suffering. Now we can talk about an informed consent. So a lot of times I try to really tell patients, you have been living with this disease for such a long time. You got used to it. You forgot what it meant. And so to me, that's what it means to get a real informed consent and, and try to, to let them understand that. Um, and the last thing I'll say about starting these therapies is that uh, I do, uh, as you mentioned, have the patients fill out those forms uh, for uh, patient assistance, but really explain to them that this is not an aspirin that you're going to get, right? It's not like, oh my God, I'm going to go to the pharmacy with that prescription and poof, it's going to be in my pocket and uh, voila, we go. <laughs> no, these are medications, right, that uh, are uh, coming through a specialized pharmacy. There is a process for that. They're not cheap. And so uh, you have to be responsive to that. And I always tell the patients when the pro uh, we have a prior authorization coordinator, and I say when that person is calling you, they are your medication angel. They're trying to fight for you and try to get you covered. So when they call you, pick up. I don't care what you're doing. Because that medication, if it's going to get shipped to your house and you're not home, you know, that's a lot of money going down the drain. And so nobody's going to send it to you unless you prove you're reliable. And so I think that's uh, part of the uh, concept of uh, initiating some of these medications and matching the expectations. Um, so now we started this treatment, right? And uh, we have to say, okay, how do we assess the response? Because, uh, you know, sometimes uh, with certain diseases, it's easy to see with HS, it may be a little tricky sometimes. Um, I know that the first step in uh, assessing response, as I mentioned, is giving it the right time. And so I always have to match that expectation with patients and tell them, hey, uh, this is at least three to four months. And we know that uh, these drugs a lot of time have a benefit that carries through up to a year uh, to really max its effect out, or at least those. Uh, this is what our studies are telling us. So we really got to give these medications time. Um, but how do you assess your success, Jenny? Yeah. I mean, I think that it's everything, really. Everything is life. <laughs> it, 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 sure. Everything in life is all about expectations, right? And so um, I think setting expectations appropriately in terms of what does treatment success look like when we're using um, a therapy such as a biologic is incredibly important. And so the thing that I think the message that you need to get across definitely includes the fact that at this point, medications are not going to make tunnels and scars just disappear, right? And so I think letting patients know that is really important because what you don't want is for them to stop the medication because they're like, I think that sinus tract is still there and it's it's not going away. So clearly this medication is not working. Um, so I think letting them know that is important and then focusing on what the medication can do. Um, and so just like you had said earlier in terms of symptom reduction, right? I'm like, patients who go on biologics, you know, largely there's less pain, there's less drainage, there's going to be fewer and less flares, hopefully. So fewer and less severe flares. So for example, if you have an HS flare, maybe now it's just going to be one to two small lesions and they go away quickly. So duration of flare goes down and it doesn't impact your quality of life the way that it used to when you got an HS flare. And I think 
talking about it in terms of decreased flare severity, frequency, and duration is helpful because then the patient also understands that I'm not looking for zero lesions and zero flares to count you know, this as a tr- treatment success. I'm looking for improvement. Um, and so what I'll say to them is when you come back in three months, those are the things I'll be looking for. I'm going to be hoping that you can tell me like, I did have one to two flares, for example, but they were much better than they used to be. So I can tell the medication's working. Yes. And, you know, I know I said uh, I like to follow up three to four months and uh, usually allow some time for them to actually get the blood work, the medication, and then start at least 12 to 16 weeks uh, at that point. But there are some patients where I'm a little nervous and I'm not sure if they're going to give up on themselves. And so I may... uh, have them actually come back within eight weeks or so. Uh, some of it is also helps to make sure that they're actually getting the medication. There is a challenge uh, with health literacy because the system is so complex, right? And getting these medications, the blood work, the prior authorization, if there's an appeal that's needed, who's doing what, a specialty pharmacy, a complicated shipment process, everything uh, can, uh, you know, there's so many steps that uh, a lot of things can go wrong. And so it's not a bad idea sometimes, uh, depending on your setup and on the patient in front of you and the uh, experience you have with these uh, drugs and specific payers to say, you know, uh, just to be on the safe side, why don't you come and check with me in six to eight weeks? We make sure uh, you are en route and also make sure they didn't give up, right? They get worse. They didn't get the medication. They give up. They're like, you know what? You know, I did the blood test, but I'm just not going to follow up on that call I got from, uh, you know, from from the insurance company. And so I find that a lot of times this is where, uh, you know, we lose energy, kind of uh, inertia, if you will. And that really is <laughs> becomes a real barrier. So every now and then, I'll have the patient come in uh, a bit earlier to do that and and to make sure that we are doing well. I also prepare patients, as you mentioned, that, you know, these medications are very good, but they're not a panacea. You're not going to be cured overnight. And for patients who are more severe, you still may need some procedures, uh, including surgery or more small deroofings. And so we I think when we discuss that, it does two things. One sets the expectation, but also gives them hope that. You know, even if after those uh, 16 weeks or so, I still have one of those major lesions that I have are still there, it doesn't mean that, you know, that's it. We failed and we can't do anything. And so I think uh, there's a lot that goes on into uh, prescribing these medications and you learn with experience. And so if you're sitting out there listening um, to us discussing this, Every patient is a little different, but the most important thing is to just do it. You have a tool in your hands. Uh, you have patients that are suffering. You can make a difference. And so just start, uh, take one patient, do it the first time, bring them follow up closer if you need to, uh, and just go for it. And you will see that the patients actually are very grateful because when it works, it's beautiful, right? Absolutely. And I feel like, um, you know, letting patients know that, yes, the medication may not you know, at this point, be able to help the tunnel just disappear. But we have things that we can do procedurally to help. And it's best in combination. And I tell patients, like, when the disease is quieter, that's when you get, like, have an easier time with a surgical procedure and with healing. And so, you know, that also, you know, helps to help the patient feel like, okay, so this treatment plan, it's comprehensive, right? It's like, we're going to address that inflammation, but for the lesions that are persistent and bothering me, there are procedures that can help with those. And, and then on the flip side, if a medication, let's say we've waited an appropriate amount of time, it's been, let's say three to four months, but we just feel like we're not quite there or that it's just not doing as much as we want, right? We can always you know, try for a higher dose of the medication or higher frequency. Um, There's literature supporting that for um, different biologics. We can add an adjunct medication, right? We talked about the hormonal metabolic type treatments, antibiotic treatments. Um, Sometimes you can use like reach for an oral retinoid, for example. Um, And then you can also at some point decide to switch to a different medication, letting the patient know, you know what, maybe this one was not um, optimal and perhaps this next one will be helpful. And um, and it's okay because we're fortunate that we have different medications in our toolbox now, um, and we just need to work to find the right one for you. And there's many more in the pipeline coming down. Um, and so the hope is that you know we see treatments that are more efficacious, um, good safety profile, just coming down that pipeline so that we can offer them to our patients 
um, and be able to give them the relief that they need from their suffering. Yeah, you bring up a good point that there's a lot of hope, right? We're seeing now an avalanche of uh, therapeutics coming down the pipeline. And it's really a good point here to put a plug for clinical trials, uh, because you have patients coming through and they may not benefit from the first or second uh, line therapies that you're trying. Well, clinical trials are there to really offer them a solution. And patients who may have contraindication to certain treatments or have failed these therapies, there are now numerous clinical trials going on, be it phase two or phase three. Uh, these programs keep going. And all you got to do is go to clinicaltrials.gov and find out what's happening. And you can ask your patients even to do it or, you know, just keep a running list in your office, have your admin every three to six months kind of update that. And those have contact information, et cetera. So it's really easy to get patient enrolled. Uh, or you may have someone in your institution, in your institution that is doing this. And so it's easy to uh, get those um, contact information and enroll patients because I tell my patients uh, when we talk about clinical trials is that, uh, a few years ago, there was someone sitting in a chair just like you and decided to participate. And now you have that choice uh, of drugs that is in my toolbox to offer to you uh, after being rigorously tested uh, and FDA approved. You may want to do that, kind of pay it forward. And I think one of the wonderful things about the HS patients as a community, I find, is that they're so generous uh, and so willing to try anything that is really um, they are a significant part of the success story uh, of HS in the last few years in bringing therapeutics uh, to the clinic. So uh, kudos to the clinical trialists, but also to the patients who really uh, make this possible. And speaking of uh, other uh, groups that can help, not just the clinical trialists, but also there are support groups uh, out there. You know, HS is a disease without a cure. And I think having someone who can listen to you is so important. And some of these support groups that are out there are doing a fantastic job. And so giving your patients that tool, it's just a link, a simple link uh, for some of uh, the support groups, which you can find on the HS Foundation website and uh, elsewhere. Uh, those groups are really, really good at uh, linking the patients and giving them uh, a listening ear that can help them go through those three to four months until you get the medication and the medication comes through. Sometimes the doctor just doesn't know that side of that story, right? And they've never had to wait, you know, three months for a drug to come in. And so other patients uh, in the support group can really help and say, you know, I went through this. Don't worry, it'll come, you know, everything will be okay. Some people are nervous about injections, for example, right? And just like, ah, don't worry. It's not such a big deal. You get used to it. Those little things that if you hear it from other patients, really, really uh, make a big difference compared to uh, hearing from a doctor. Absolutely. I feel like um, one of the things about HS is it can be a very isolating condition. I know that, you know, all of us, the HS patient community, HS foundation, us as just clinicians um, specializing in HS, we um, really are working to help raise HS awareness, but it's just not quite in the patient, uh, in the public psyche, the way that they understand what acne is or eczema or psoriasis, but, you know, one day we'll get there with HS, but um, currently it is, I think just more isolating with the public, not really knowing what it is. It's difficult to explain it to friends, to loved ones. Um, and so having, um, you know, having, uh, an HS patient community is really just, I think can, can really be life-changing for some of my patients who have told me, like, I've never met anybody else with HS. I mean, that's very isolating. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I know that we both have, you know, local Hope for HS support group chapters, um, which always, always after I leave one of those meetings, I feel so inspired by my patients. Um, and it's so wonderful to get a chance to chat with them outside of the clinic room um, and have them just watch them chat with each other, lift each other up, share experiences and tips. Um, and so Hope for HS, you know, HS Connect, International Association for HS Network, all really wonderful resources that we can provide um, to patients at the end of a clinic visit, just giving them that link or telling them the name and telling them to Google it so we can connect them with the community, um, you know, of patients out there so they feel less alone. And um, I, I think that's really important for mental health as well. Yeah, no, excellent points. I agree 100%. And 
I hope for uh, those of you who are listening out there, uh, you're a healthcare provider, and if you have tried uh, some of these targeted therapies and advanced therapies for HS, then hopefully you've got a few tips uh, on how to uh, improve things or maybe uh, help you with some of the patients that you haven't considered this therapy before. Because really, as we discussed, there is that concept of the window of opportunity. And if you wait, you may be late. Oh, I just coined that. Okay. If you oh wait. Oh my you goodness, late. Sadar. <laughs> Jenny, I got it. Yeah. So, but if you wait, you may be late and then your patients will suffer. And we've seen so many disaster stories. We just don't want to get there. And in this day and age, with these targeted therapies that combine with other medications and procedures, we can really make a big difference. There's really no reason uh, to wait. And as I mentioned, you know, if you start early and you decide, ah, you know, it's not worth it, you can always stop uh, the drug. But the other way around, you won't be able to stop the disease. And so I really uh, hope that those of you who are listening really uh, feel uh, empowered now and encouraged to either continue what you're doing or at least give it a try. I would say give it a shot, but that'll be too much. Oh of my a pun, goodness, right? another yeah. pun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I think um, maybe just a couple final tips on like, you know, how patients might bring up a concern and how you might try to alleviate. So when patients come and tell me they just think a medication, they feel like a biologic would be, you know, too strong. Um, I, I think one thing that we can counter with is that a lot of these medications are, you know, we use them in women who are breastfeeding. There are biologic medications that are, you know, FDA approved down to the age of two, like toddlers for other conditions. And I think, you know, emphasizing that, you know, there these are medications that have, they've been out for years. They've been approved for other conditions in pediatric, like very young patients, um, and that we even use them in breastfeeding women um, can be helpful just to emphasize like the flip side of that safety conversation. Um, and then getting over that, you know, a lot of patients, it's, it's tough because they've only ever taken oral medications and now they're switching to like a shot form of medication. One thing that's been actually helpful is I feel like a lot of, a lot more patients are coming to me on those injectable GLP-1 agonists and are more willing actually to take another medication that is an injection because they're already on one. But if not, I think I talked to them about how like insulin is a medicine that's been around forever and that's a shot. And you don't see the needle for these medications. It comes as a pen or as my colleague, Dr. Vivian, she will say, like, it looks like an EpiPen, right? We see people with EpiPens walking around. Um, yeah. And so just really trying to contextualize it so that it's not as foreign of a concept, having the nurse and staff support who can come in with that training pen, show them what it looks like there. You don't see the needle. It looks just like a pen that you click. I think all of those are things that we can do to help ease um, the mind of the patient sitting in front of us who has to really sort of shift the way that they're thinking about medications, um, especially because previously they might not have ever needed to inject themselves. Yes. Well, uh, for those of you out there, I hope you benefited from uh, this discussion. I know I certainly did. Thank you very much, uh, Jenny, for uh, sharing your expertise uh, with me and our listeners. And uh, I really hope that uh, all of you out there stay informed. There's a lot of new developments coming down the pipeline, and uh, there are new drugs that are going to be approved uh, pretty much every year for the next decade or so. I really hope so. So we are at the precipice of change for HS, and I hope that you will join us in uh, our excitement and benefit for the patients. Thank you for tuning in to Derm Docs, powered by LiveDerm. Stay tuned for future episodes discussing all things Derm.